I don't want to see Jordan over me breakfast rolling out of a pub with a tits out. Who is Jordan? Who is he? I thought he was a country. What does become a little bit of a pisser is at 8 o'clock at night, you can't find anything you want to watch. Lesbian, three in a bed, s and action. I don't watch this shit. And there's a strange man on CNF who talks as though he's gargling his own sick. You silly little twat, right, little bigot in Nick. Fucking never want to read that again. It's ugly, it's vicious, it's spiteful. But do I read it? Of course I read it. The 35 to 54 year old group of grumpy old men grew up when the Times had no pictures on the front page and The Guardian was printed in Manchester and had proper writers. The sun was something celestial and illuminating and the mirror reflected real life. Then there was the BBC, with a mission to inform, educate and entertain us. Whatever happened to that idea? Today we've got hundreds of TV channels and thousands of radio stations. We've got way too many newspapers and magazines with too many pages full of too many air-headed columnists spouting off with their endless, empty-headed drivel. My car's been broken into, hence a thousand words on the state of the criminal justice system yeah, and the ineptitude of the police. True. Um, my experience as being a father for the first time and watching the miracle of birth... <laughs> fucking never want to read that again. And, and, the, and the, my wobbly shopping trolley. And now for the average grumpy old man, the first thing you'll probably hear in the morning is John Humphreys, ripping the heart and lungs out of some hapless politician who'd prefer to be able to ruin our lives without the inconvenience of having to account for their actions. Mr the Home Secretary, he's not entitled to do that. Um, but he's, he's also a representative he's of, for the law. of the people too. And, I think he was genuinely and just when there's a risk that you might start feeling sorry for the politician, you're interrupted by the newspapers dropping through the letterbox. Now, time was, your daily newspaper used to include news. Quaint thought, isn't it? But now, with all that constant radio news and 24-hour TV news and online news and news flashes on your mobile, the papers don't stand a chance. Printed six hours earlier, they're always out of date. But ever resourceful, they can usually find something the broadcasters have overlooked. I mean, I do love the tabloids. I mean, just you know, a few months ago, there was that Australian man, and he did, I've only read this in the tabloids, blew his nose and shot two-thirds of his fr frontal lobes. Down his, his nose. Brain. That's fantastic, and that's why I just... He had, he had hay fever. <laughs> and his last thought was, fuck. <laughs> He's angry. Nobody knows what to believe anymore because they make so much up. They do so many things that I, I'm, I'm sure they work. Well, we'll print this. Uh, how many more copies we're going to sell? Does that justify what we're going to get sued for? If it does, we'll print it. They're all trying to generate sensation. They're trying to generate an emotional reaction. Yeah. So they have to mix it. They have to uh, make it as horrifying, as amusing, as titillating, whatever, as they possibly can. Now, time was, if you were a grumpy, you could at least buy the top people's newspaper and remain loftily detached from all that sleaze. Nowadays, it seems there's no place to hide. People can have the superficial choice uh, between the Daily Pratt or the Daily Tap, but actually they're getting the same rubbish. Often, if you look at page three of the Daily Telegraph, and the inside page of The Sun, they're the same stories. Most of them appear to me to want a very, very simple, lazy story. That means they write about two things, nationalism in one form or another, introversion, Brits are best, all that stuff. And the other one is sex. Yes, this is what passes for journalism these days. The bilious outpourings of venomous tosh from editors with extremist views. 
or half-literate journalist hyping up the sex lives of anyone making the mistake of passing in front of the public's attention for a nanosecond. If you read on the front of that paper that so-and-so has you know, done it eight times, was absolutely insatiable, well, you know that they're either on extraordinary drugs, some of them might be coloured blue from what I hear, or that they've done a deal with the paper to be made to look as though they're naughty boys, but at least they're great lovers. So you take that consolation out of it. And all you know is that if, if, that, piece of pa if that paper then prints a story about someone being hung like a hamster and useless in bed, well, um, they were bang to rights anyway and the paper didn't care. I woke up the other day and tried to remember if I, maybe I have actually had sex with David Beckham because there's so much in the papers about it, everything is about it. I kind of think, well, maybe I must have done as well then. And no one is exempt from the fearless investigations by Fleet Street's finest. Not even people as endearing and inoffensive as our grumpies. I had one occasion way back in the 80s when a girl sold a story of one of the typical My Mad Nights of Passion sort of thing. I mean, I had, like, press camping outside my house and it was a total non-story. It was... How it ever came... However they took up so much space in the paper, I could never understand it. I mean, the worst thing I remember, I was just walking up the hill from the cookery school and this guy jumped out of a car with a telephoto lens, started taking pictures of me, you know, and you just feel like you're on the run. I cannot imagine that... A tabloid newspaper sells one extra copy because on page two is a really nasty, totally untrue story about me. Who the hell buys a newspaper because there's a story about Kinnock? The tabloids largely leave me very much alone because they haven't got a fucking clue who I am. Gary Bushell once said that I was a disease and the only cure for it was amputation at the neck. And he said that I should be stuffed with gelignite and ignited. Gary Bushell. Then it's on, I'll ever appear on anything, he'll slag me off. But then I get my own back. I've got a feud with him. I've slagged him off in a number of publications. Silly little twat, right, little bigoted nit. You know, and, you know, he's one of those people, one of those TV people who are reporting on TV but really want to be in it, want to be on TV themselves. And he was always writing about comedians and he wanted to be a comedian. And I saw his act, he's absolutely bloody awful, you know, he's shit. There's no doubt that British tabloid newspapers are world-class when it comes to personality destruction. When they get someone in their sights and they go for them, believe me, they get them. And it's not nice to watch, it's ugly, it's vicious, it's spiteful. But do I read it? Of course I read it. I love it. <laughs> And since these days the weekend papers come in 16 sections and weigh about three and three quarter hundred weight, there's a lot of space to fill. Thereby providing a decent living for all those very talented wordsmiths of whom nothing would otherwise ever have been heard. If you're a columnist, 52 weeks of the year, well, 38 in his case, because A.A. <laughs> Gill is usually away, but some of us who work for a living, 52 weeks of the year, you have to come up with something that's happened. Sometimes you wake up and think, I haven't got out of bed all week, I haven't, I've done absolutely jack shit. So you've got to come up with something and then you notice that your daughter's bought something from the Argos catalogue and there's a thousand words. And it doesn't really matter whether you're talking about your garden or your children or your dog or whatever. All of which I have to say in my time as a columnist, I went on about all the fucking time because what else do you write about? Um, I was just amazed that anybody had ever bothered to pay me to do it. People assume that their lives are interesting merely by having written them down, and <laughs> they're not. Tom Stoppard, the, uh, the playwright, um, I think he got it just right. Uh, he said that uh, journalists think that the most important and most interesting aspect of a story is the fact that they've turned up to cover it. And, unfortunately, I think most of us in the media suffer from that. Meanwhile, back at the breakfast table, our grumpies get to choose between two very well-turned-out but far too wholesome and well-scrubbed people on a red sofa. Or then there's Penny Smith, this morning wearing a nightie, as mad as a box of frogs but nice to wake up to. Chance would be a fine thing. Looks warm and cosy, doesn't it? All those potted flowers. Is and she wants to have a simpler life. I can barely keep my eyes open. So why on earth does this poor woman have to stand outside in a blizzard, smack bang in the middle of nowhere, because traffic's being held up on roads like the one behind her? Moving from the southwest across Britain as we. And where on earth is this woman? She could be anywhere, and is. 
And believe it or not, this bloke is standing outside Heathrow Airport. What does he know standing there that he wouldn't know just as well indoors? And what's he doing standing outside the Prime Minister's house? Apart from having a very bad hair day. Nothing has happened here for eight hours and nothing's going to happen for the next three. Or could it be because otherwise we viewers might be too stupid to realise that this is a story about politics? Well, the key point here is that they're outside number 10. I'm outside number 10. We're all outside number 10. We want to hear from somebody who's inside number 10. And since these days we can't apparently wait five minutes to learn that the Edinburgh bin men might be planning to strike in three months' time, we have to have rolling news. The only trouble is that mostly the news doesn't so much roll as dribble. Quite often there isn't enough news to roll with. So you've got large spells where nothing's going on and you're listening to an interview with some geezer that you know, means nothing, has nothing to say, and you don't care about. But unfortunately, if you're called News 24 or Sky News and everybody knows it's round the clock, you've got to be on. Rolling news about bugger all is just, just a complete waste of time, really. News does not happen, interesting news does not happen regularly every ten minutes around the world. And there's a strange man on CNF who talks as though he's gargling his own sick. But if you just sit back and let it wash over you, you know, you can watch people being murdered and butchered and blown up and all that, and it's somehow distanced from you. And the more stuff you get, the more, the more you don't really participate in it. So, lest we should realise that everyday reporting is, well, everyday, everything has to be hyped up to make it seem unusual. So that every day when a tragedy happens is that fateful day. Every insight is profound. No investigation can be anything less than special. Every fire is an inferno. Every rescue heroic. Every death from cancer follows a brave fight. And every crisis is serious. What other sort of crisis is there, for heaven's sake? And uh, we'll be back a little later. I wish Hugh Edwards would say, right, we're going live now to uh, newsrooms in your area. And I'd love him to be sitting with his feet on his desk and just go, nothing, absolutely nothing's happened. Nothing that you'd be interested in has happened here today. But instead of which, there's always a garden fence that's blown over. And always an old lady who has to be made to be angrier about it than she really is. How angry are you about this, that they're yeah. closing the community centre? I'm very angry. <laughs> no, Sal, come on. Everything we hear on the media is hyped up beyond recognition, and so everybody around you is talking like they've just fallen out of the cast of an American soap. Young people now, you hear them say, Oh, my God, I think, what's happened? Has someone attacked you? Has someone shot you? Like, oh, my God, you know, this smart is the wrong colour. This, this, people overemphasise now such that they sort of lose the capacity to, to express genuine emotion. Where does I'm so not happy come from? <laughs> it makes me weak to even think about it. This so thing, which people use and, and think of as a kind of uh, wit. It started out, I believe, with Roseanne Barr, who said to a writer, you are so fired. I'm at it 24-7. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You think, oh, well, you did the abbreviation. Don't then do the whole thing. No, sir, that's not going to be possible. I'm going to need for you to sit down. I'm going to need for you to sit down. That's the bastardization of the English language, and they're responsible. I'm going to... Your, sir, you're going to need... I'm going to... Just stop using words where you don't need to. Time your um, deliverables. What does time your deliverables mean? I have no idea. What about the heroes? The use of the word hero to describe a footballer, doesn't that drive you mad? Some bloke who's been on Emmerdale Farm, it turns out, is a superstar. Uh, or even a star is frankly going a bit too far for some of these people. I mean, you know, someone who's read the news on Balder TV is down as a star and they've got their picture in Hello magazine, you know, and let's go and look round their house. These nothing people, well, I'm not interested. Superstar, megastar. How many megastars are there in the world? David Bowie, Madonna, the Queen. You're making a list now. See, I hate lists. I hate lists more than I hate heroes, superstars and megastars. Robert Redford. 
they're megastars, and yet somebody scores, kicks an inflated sheep's pancreas. Why is Robert Redford more of a megastar than David Beckham? Yes. Where once our heroes were Kennedy or Gandhi or Neil Armstrong, today, well, let's just say the currency is slightly devalued. David Beckham quite clearly is a celebrity. I mean, he is at the peak of celebrity dumb, isn't he? Um, because he can kick a football quite well. And, and his wife, because she can't sing very well, is also um, at the peak of celebrity. What is it? What is celebrityness? The star is somebody who's on daytime television doing, you know, he's the host of. Whose turd is this? We photograph celebrity lavatories, and you have to guess whose feces this is, you know? I mean, if that exists already, that programme, then I'm really sorry, I didn't realise it. If it doesn't exist, I'd like to copyright it and have it on Sky 52 as soon as possible. And they said, do you know the name of any other celebrities? <laughs> I said, look, there's just one thing I should tell you. I am not a celebrity. I am... There's, there's considerable doubt about whether I'm a writer. I think that I'm certainly not, repeat, not a celebrity. And please don't call me a celebrity because it's a sort of offensive term in my eyes because it doesn't mean anything. Tomorrow, people will look at you and they'll go, Oh, Jeremy, I saw you last night. Who was that funny little bloke you were on with? Yeah, and that little Indian bloke. No, I... <laughs> And they'll have no idea. And nobody will stop me in a shop and go, oh, 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 it's you, know, isn't it? I know, but when Operation All catches up with you, <laughs> then you really had it. In fact, so uninterested are our grumpies in celebrity that sometimes a whole cultural phenomenon can pass them by entirely. Who is John? Who is he? What? Who is he? Sorry. Who the hell is Katie Price? Jordan with the breasts. Right. I thought it was a country. When you say Jordan to me... I think of a tourist in Petra with bloody great big tits. I mean, I don't want to see Jordan over me breakfast in the gossip column with rolling out of a pub with the tits out. Being uh, an empty-headed, big-titted uh, fool, that's her job, and she's, made, you know, and she's prepared to do that job, whereas other people are that, but pretend otherwise. I mean, I think she has a kind of refreshing honesty about Jordan. Oh, do I think of Jordan? I think of a woman who's been extremely clever at man manipulating people and press brilliantly, and, and I don't mean that in a nasty way. I think she's been really clever, and good luck to her. Just as a personal preference, I like things to be natural. I mean, uh, what do men really want? I mean, do they? I mean, it's that big. I mean, what would you do with them? I, you know, a decent handful. Thank you very much. Not, not so you've got to get a kind of JCB to, to move them about. A vivid image, Arthur, for which we're all no doubt grateful. So, of course, like everything else, it's all the fault of the telly. Acres and acres of programmes produced for half-wits by half-wits, celebrating ignorance and we wonder why the kids can't write a letter or hold a conversation. It's easy to slag off, uh, you know, reality TV, and uh, so I might as well do it. <laughs> they have discovered they could spend two million an hour producing a great Elizabethan drama and get slightly less audience than they would do if they did Big Brother, which involves pointing a load of cameras at people uh, farting, sleeping and doing something really dramatic, eating a bowl of cornflakes. They'll do anything to get on the telly. And people will go out, rip all their clothes off, wrestle with crocodiles, have sex with gorillas, anything to draw attention to themselves on telly. You know, you put, like, a fishbowl over their head and fill it up with centipedes and insects, and, and, and I think, where, how is this real? I mean, where's the reality? This, what, whose reality is this? You know, um, it just there's nothing about these programs that seems to reflect any reality that I've ever encountered. The best way to punish the contestants on Big Brother would be you do it all for real as normal, do everything as normal, but then just don't put it on the television. And when they come running out, there's an empty car park and a bloke sweeping up saying, they've all gone home, mate. This 
may contain strong language and have scenes of a sexual nature. And you think, well, that's... that's why. So why don't they do it with every programme, you know? And now the weather forecast. This may contain strong language and scenes of a sexual nature. And you still watch... Hang on, darling, just watching the weather forecast. <laughs> if it's a choice between uh, club reps show their tits... I'd rather watch Hetty Hainrop Hay Investigates, or whatever it is. Oh, no, what's the one... Uh, what's that one uh, that's always on? Murder, she wrote, yeah. <laughs> the Games. That was the one for me when I sat with a mouth like a guppy. When they said, and here she comes now, the next contestant, and it's Victoria Harvey. Oh, God, Victoria Harvey, they're really scraping the barrel. But no, Victoria Harvey's sister. Someone who's not famous as sister, was a celebrity on a show to see if she could jump over something. But now they've all got the same haircut, the same short skirt, the same attitude. That's the one that gets me. You've got to have attitude. <laughs> and all attitude means is just being a bit snotty. <laughs> this guy has no skill. You've got attitude. Oh, he's got attitude. Yeah. What does that mean? He's rude. Oh, right, great. That's a marvellous thing, then. All the programme makers have had got to find a way every few seconds to make it exciting! Like I did then. Did you see what I did? And respect. You've got to have respect all the time. You must be respected. Or, you know, everyone's looking for respect above all else. You know, to be honest, I don't mind if some people don't respect me. Fuck them. Yes. Our grumpies remember the days when the news was read by serious men sitting behind desks who could scarcely keep their toupees on straight. Proper news readers. Nowadays, these poor devils have to walk sideways, remembering to glance back and forth at pictures you know they can't see, so you can get the most out of the hey wow graphics. Poor old Sir Trevor. Looks about as comfortable as he would if they dressed him up as a Bay City roller. And you just. What, what, what's happened? What's this all about? And you think. You, you, gradually it dawns on you that somebody must have said, I've got an idea that will really make the news the news viewing experience, much improved, will take your desk away. But the violence goes on. And this is something that happens just across the board. I mean, almost every experience in some way or other is, is just puzzling, and you can't see how people thought this was an improvement. But that's enough complaining about the programmes. Let's complain about the adverts. These days, they cost more than the shows they get in the way of. And if we're lucky, we even get a little story. Four blokes playing squash. And then one of them says, yes, I've been headhunted by the board. And the other one says... I've doubled my turnover to up to uh, 125 mil, you know. And the other one says something else, and then they're all in the car after. Well, they drive off and they're off looking around this car. Thing. So one of them hasn't spoken, he says... What did you say you did? And I wish he'd say, I steal cars. But he doesn't. He says... I didn't. You know, and they think, well, why are you driving this fucking cheap Japanese car, then? And lest we should be accused of sneering only at commercial television, let's have a good hard bite at the hand that feeds us. The issue for the BBC is that there are a load of bloody left-wing turds, right? Not paid very well, right? They, they like the politics. It's as, if, it's as though a television channel was being produced at Oxford, right? They enjoy, they enjoy the politics of it as much as they enjoy what's actually produced at the end of the bloody day. The thing about working for the BBC that really drives me crazy is that you have to be so reasonable. At all times, they expect you to be fair and balanced. And sometimes being fair and balanced is so ludicrous that it just kills the story. Ah, oh, yes, the need for balance, which obliges us, though otherwise, of course, we wouldn't, to extend our ungenerous remarks to those purveyors of elegant satellite dishes which now grace and enhance just about every home in the land. A message came back from the great beyond. There's 57 channels and nothing on. 57 channels and nothing on. I must admit, I've got the all singing, all dancing you know, satellite with 496 channels, is what does become a little bit of a pisser is at 8 o'clock at night, you can't find anything you want to watch. I could never get the hang of it, because there is, when you've got that many choices, you, there's always this feeling that there must be something better than this somewhere else. The shopping channel, and it's bad for you. I recommend, you know, that's worse than smoking, in a way. 
But, uh, yeah, you get to know some of these little people who appear to be obsessed with, you know, their new egg-frying machine or something. And, <laughs> and they love it, don't they? And there's a half-hour programme about it, and people in the audience going, wow! <laughs> this new knife can cut onions twice as fast as the left. Oh, wow, my life is complete. <laughs> we have a programme about uh, scorpions having it off. You know, It's sex in the dust. Next on National Geographic, sex, claw, fang, talon. You know, in the old days, it was Oxford Scientific Films present the reproductive cycle of the higher arachnids, you know. And they have auditions for new presenters on cable TV. And uh, there's just all these kids who think that you say, oh, well, I've got loads of personality, whereas the truth is that they just drink too much Sunny Delight and think their navel will make them popular. And then the researchers will say to all these kids, kids, just get out there and be yourselves, ignoring the fact that they wouldn't be there if they didn't want to be somebody else. <laughs> But the worst thing about the media, absolutely the worst thing, is that it's so very far up its own bottom. It can't get enough of itself. If it's not giving itself prizes and awards for the best bit of grim and bloody news in some country full of poor people, it's the most excruciating moment in a badly written soap or the most egregious rip-off of an existing reality show. Every award ceremony is hell, and they're mostly hell because of you. Because you turn up and they say, and tonight, to present the awards, we have you, Angus Jonathan Deaton. Ross, Angus Deaton... Frank Skinner, Frank, some other Stephen Fry. ...noddy off the telly. I'll sit through two hours of an awards ceremony just for that one wonderful moment when, when a celeb falls flat on their face and makes a total arse of themselves. We love it when we win them. Of course, when we don't win them, they're meaningless trinkets and we wouldn't... Um, dignify the occasion with our presence. But when we're up for an award, we're straight up there, black tie, grinning, top hole. But you might think it odd that we who work in TV should make a programme about how bloody awful it is. But don't think you out there in viewing land escape criticism, sitting out there with your feet up, feeling all smug and superior. All we do is give you more of the stuff you actually watch. You read and watch rubbish, so you get more rubbish. We're like those supermarket shelf stackers. You buy the stuff, and we come out at night and fill the shelves up again. If you really watched those highbrow programmes, as you say you do, we'd still be in the golden age. Or is that just our sad, sentimental and fading memories? No, there was no golden age. There was, I mean, cos what came on before Civilization on BBC Two was the Black and White Minstrel Show. There was no fucking golden age of television. And, it, and, that, green, and, that's a, and that really is a nonsense, is that if you take a whole decade and you pick out the likely lads, Cathy Come Home, The Ascent of Man and one other thing, you've got five hours of television. From a know, decade. Out of a decade. There's more good television made now and shown now than there has ever been. But, but there is also, consummately, a fuck of a lot more dross, and most of it presented by him. Yeah. And, and probably an awful bit of it that we're now taking part in. <laughs> Why does everything have to be so quick all the time, relentlessly fast-paced, in order that you can sit down and watch TV that's relentlessly fast and full of noise and fury? And it's all full of noise and fury, and it all does signify nothing. And people are petrified of the idea of one person just sitting down and doing nothing, not eating, not talking, not watching the TV, not listening to their iPod or their Walkman, not looking at adverts, not hearing adverts boomed out from somewhere else, not avoiding people coming by with leaflets. They hate the idea that just someone could just sit there quietly on their own. The beast in me is caged by frail and fragile bars Restless by day and by night Rants and rages at the stars God help the beast in me Lovely. The beast in me